ان الحمد لله نحمد ونستعين ونستغفر ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله Indeed all praise is due to Allah and as such we should praise him seek his help and seek refuge in Allah from the evil which is within ourselves and the evil which results from our deeds for whomsoever Allah has guided none can misguide and whomsoever Allah has allowed to go astray none can guide and i bear witness that there's no god worthy of worship but Allah and that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the last messenger of Allah in asdaq al hadith kitab Allah indeed the most truthful form of speech is the book of Allah wa khayr hadi hadi Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the best source of guidance was the guidance brought by Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam وَشَرَّ الْأُمُورِ مُحْدَثَاتُهَا And the worst of all affairs are innovations in religion. فَإِنَّ كُلَّ مُحْدَثَةٍ بِدْعَةٍ وَكُلَّ بِدْعَةٍ ضَلَالَةٍ وَكُلَّ ضَلَالَةٍ فِي النَّارِ For every innovation in religion is a cursed innovation. And every cursed innovation can only be a source of misguidance. And all misguidance leads ultimately to the hellfire. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, brothers and sisters. Today we'll be looking at the moral character principles to be deduced from belief in the messengers of Allah. And this is a continuation of what we started many jumas ago looking at the moral principles behind the pillars of islam and iman or the pillars of faith because as we said these pillars of islam and pillars of faith were designed by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fulfill or to help us to fulfill the goals of Islam and among the highest goals of Islam as prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said inna ma bu'ithtu li utammima makarim al akhlaq i was only sent to perfect for you the highest of moral character traits so this is among the highest goals of islam that it bring out of us we deduce from its teachings and apply in our lives moral principles which would guide us throughout our lives in this world in our day to day life with our families with our neighbors with our community with the country in which we live how we deal with the environment around us how we deal uh, on the job how we do we deal as directors of companies street cleaners whatever position we might be in society there is guidance in islam moral guidance in islam for each and every one of us and that is a part of the uniqueness and the beauty of islam that it addresses the needs of all members of society it is not for a specific class or caste but it is for each and every individual so in the previous uh, juma uh, we looked at the belief in the angels and in the books Prior to that we looked at belief in 
Allah. These are the first three pillars of faith. Today we're looking at belief in the messengers of Allah. And this is an extension of belief in the books. It shares the same common concept that Allah revealed His word, His message to human beings. He did not create us and leave us to find our own way. He has provided guidance. So each human being can find out if he seeks to find it, each and every human being can find the way that Allah has prescribed for him or for her in this life. If it were not the case, if it were not the case that each person could find the way, and it was just a question of being born in Muslim families, then surely it would be unjust for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put people in paradise because they were born in Muslim families and put other people in hell because they were not born in Muslim families. When He is the one who determines whose family we were born in. Where would be the justice? When Allah is most just. So we know that it is not about the family that you are born in. A person may be born in a Muslim family and may be on the lowest levels of the hellfire. And another person may be born in a non-Muslim fa family and be among the highest levels in paradise. So it is not about which family we were born in. It is about each and every human being finding his way in this life. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his wisdom and his mercy and his grace revealed books as we spoke about previously and he sent along with those books messengers who would explain to the people how to apply the books. Because the books is one thing, it's important, it's critical, it's a document explaining how we are supposed to function in this life. However, that document without someone to demonstrate how to use the document becomes like the scriptures of the others, of the Christians and the Jews, where the explanation of how to apply is not applied. And each individual, whether he is a rabbi, or he is a priest or a minister, it is up to him to extract from, from the scriptures how he thinks it should be applied. So, of course, as human beings, we all have minds, we all have imaginations, we can all come up with something. And that's why we have around us so many different religions. Though Allah, as we said much earlier, revealed only one religion. The religion which was revealed to Adam and Eve was none other than Islam. Have no doubt about it. What was commanded of them was to obey Allah. Submit their wills to Allah. And that is Islam. Submission of the human will to God. So, belief in the messengers is belief that not only did Allah give us a blueprint, He also sent human beings, chose from among human beings, individuals of exemplary character who would live that life which Allah wanted us to live. If there was no one to live the life, no example, then we could say, having read the book, hey, no, who could do this? Who could live like this? We are human beings, we commit errors, how can we live that life? Well, Allah brought prophets to demonstrate, chose prophets from amongst us, to demonstrate for us that this blueprint which He gave 
is applicable. It can be lived. It is livable. So the messengers were fundamentally the example for us. As Allah said, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ There is in the Messenger of Allah for you the best example. His exemplary ca character demonstrates to us how to implement the Qur'an. This is not unique to Muhammad wasallam. Prophet Isa represented the example of how to implement the Gospel, the Injil. Prophet Musa was the example of how to implement the Torah. And Prophet Dawood, the Zabur, etc., etc. All of the Prophets were examples showing the people how to implement the book. So, basically, belief in the messengers involves belief that Allah has chosen people of exemplary character to show us how to live in accordance with His will. That requires that we reject all of the false information that can be found in the various scriptures which attribute to the prophets all kinds of corruption. All kinds of corruption. When we look in the Old Testament, which contains books attributed to the prophets, we find the prophets described as drunkards, committing incest, adultery, patronizing prostitutes, and worshipping idols. All of these are acts attributed to the prophets. Prophet Suleiman in particular is described as worshipping idols in his old age. For us to believe in the prophets is to believe that these were lies about the prophets. Because if prophets were to demonstrate for us how to live that life which Allah wanted, then surely they would not be uh, examples of idolatry, examples of corruption. No. So we reject all of those uh, texts as slander and abuse of the prophets. And we hold the prophets in high esteem as Allah described them as being chosen to be above the rest of the world. And of course, that addresses, this point addresses what is attributed to Prophet Isa. Which is that he was supposed to have been the son of God. To have been the third of a trinity. To have invited people to worship him. That is far greater in evil than even attributing prostitution you know, patronizing prostitutes uh, to the prophets. That is, no, you can't go any further than that. To claim that Prophet Isa was God incarnate, this is misguidance in its worst stage. So, we have to, in believing in the messengers, we have to reject such stories as Allah described in the Quran that Prophet Isa will be asked, saying, and this is in the in Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 116, 117, when Allah will say, O Jesus, son of Mary, did you tell people to worship you and your mother as gods besides Allah? He will reply, Glory be to you. It was not fitting for me to say that, what I had no right to say. I never said to them anything but what you commanded me to say, Worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. Prophet Isa, even in the corrupted texts of the Gospels, called people to worship Allah. And he himself worshipped Allah. However, after his time, people changed that message. And they made him a god besides Allah. So, belief in the messengers, all coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, also means belief that their message was one. And the essence of that message was to worship Allah alone, as Allah states in the Quran, 
وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا I have sent to every nation a messenger. أَنْ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهُ وَاجْتَنِبُ الطَّاغُوتِ Commanding people to worship Allah and to avoid the worship of false gods. This was the singular message of all of the prophets. In terms of the sharia, the sharia may have varied in terms of what people were instructed to do in different times, different places, etc. Fundamental sharia remains the same, but there were uh, variations depending on the needs of the society of the time. But the essential theological message, the essence of belief, was that Allah is one, uniquely one, and that He alone deserves our worship. <clears throat> and as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, He sent to every nation a messenger. So as Prophet Muhammad said that Allah sent over 124,000 prophets, we don't have a problem with that. Over 124,000 prophets were sent throughout the world. The vast majority of them, we have no idea what their names were. Only 25 are mentioned in the Quran. But we believe in all of them. Sent to all nations of the world. And whatever good we see today in various nations, in their belief system, in their practice, etc., this is leftovers from the teachings of the earlier prophets who were sent to them. Belief in the messengers creates first and foremost in us a questioning personality. That we are not a personality, or we don't possess a personality which blindly accepts whatever is handed to us. Accept, accepts what is handed to us from our culture, from our families, our society. We question everything. If it is not from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, clearly a verse from the Qur'an, or it has not been explained by Prophet Muhammad sallallahu an instruction from him, then we question it. We have to question where did it come from, what is the basis for it, does it contradict Islamic teachings, or does it not? We don't blindly accept culture and tradition as the foundation of our Islam. Which is what, unfortunately today, most Muslims are caught up in. So much so that we can hardly distinguish between what is Islam and what is our culture. And for the outsider, non-Muslims, in many parts of our world, Muslim world, they are confused. They think that honor killing, killing, family members to protect the honor of the family is a part of Islamic teachings. They think that giving dowry to uh, the men is a part of Muslim practice like it was in Europe where the dowry is given to the men. Not the men giving dowry to the women, which is actually Islamic teachings. And they think that female genital mutilation is an Islamic teaching found in different parts of the Muslim world today. And so on and so forth. A lot of cultural practices that have no basis in Islamic teachings are now associated with Islam and Muslims. We can only rid ourselves of that by beginning to question, to ask, to put our foot down, and to challenge the custom and the tradition in order to find Islam which was brought by Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ورسائل المسلمين من كل ذنب فاستغفروا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم I say that asking Allah to forgive myself and yourselves 
and call on you to turn to him and seek his forgiveness for none can forgive sins besides him alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah this first moral principle of questioning and putting things on a scale to judge it right and wrong and not just to do it simply because everybody else does it you know we call this peer pressure everybody else around you is doing it so you feel obliged to do it we reject that what this calls us to ultimately is to realize that the madhab that we should be following and most of us are either following Hanafi, Shafi, Maliki or Hanbali madhabs that the madhab that we should be following in our minds in our hearts should be the madhab of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we should have no doubt about this you shouldn't be sitting there thinking, what is he saying? He's saying we should be following a different madhab from Imam Shafi or Imam Abu Hanifa. No. You should be clear that the madhab of Imam Abu Hanifa was the madhab of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that the madhab of Imam Shafi'i was the madhab of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Just as the madhab of Abu Huraira, who narrated the largest amount of traditions from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Huraira, the leading companion to narrate the sunnah to us, his madhab was, was he a Hanafi? Was he a Shafi'i? Was he a Hanbali or a Maliki? Of course, somebody in ignorance might say, yeah, yeah, he was a Maliki. But this is ignorance. That is ignorance. Imam Malik didn't come along until a hundred years after Ab Abu Huraira. So he could not have been a follower of Imam Malik. He was a follower of the Madhab of Rasulullah and that's what unifies Muslims that we understand that the great scholars the Imams to whom we attribute madhabs who didn't follow these madhabs that they followed a single madhab and that in following their madhabs this was a way to help us to follow that same single madhab. I'm not saying you cannot follow the Shafi'i madhab or the Hanbali madhab. These are schools of Islamic law. Scholars over the generations have striven to apply the Sharia in our day-to-day -day lives and they help to clarify for us how to apply the law in our lives. They were efforts, human efforts which contain errors because they were human beings. The only infallible madhab was that of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And that should be clear in our hearts and our minds. We take a knowledge from the scholars. We have to. Because Allah said, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask those who know if you don't know. We shouldn't say, well, no, no, I'm not going to follow any madhab, I'm not going to follow any scholar, I just go to the Quran and the Sunnah all by myself and follow it. Well, that is a mistake. Because if we ourselves do not have sufficient knowledge to understand the sea of the Quran and the sea of the Sunnah, then we will misguide ourselves and misguide others. So that's why Allah raised up in the Ummah people of knowledge who would continue to guide the Ummah along the path which was left by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
Secondly, in terms of our character, we should develop a moral character of devout obedience. That we are fundamentally obedient individuals. Obedient to Allah and His Messenger. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Following the Messenger of Allah should develop in us this sense of obedience. Because He is the one who we should follow unquestioningly. He is the only one. And in following Him, it trains us also in obeying the commandments of Allah. Because as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, مَن يُتِعِ الرَّسُولِ فَقَدْ أَطَعَ اللَّهِ Whoever obeys the messenger has obeyed Allah. So our obedience to Prophet Muhammad sallam is not because of anything special about himself in terms of his physical characteristics, etc., his mind. Is, no, it is because of revelation. As he was told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to say, قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ Say, I'm a human being like the rest of you. So in that regard, he's like everybody else. Except that Allah revealed to him that our Lord is one Lord. Revelation is what distinguishes the Prophet Muhammad Because there are righteous people among us. When we say he was like the rest of us, it doesn't mean like the worst of us. It means like the rest of the best of us. There are righteous people who didn't receive revelation. And Allah will give them special blessings in their life to come. So he is from that group. That's who Allah chose. When He chose messengers, He didn't choose them from the lowest, the dregs of society. He chose them from the best. The best in terms of spirit, not necessarily the wealthiest or the most powerful, but the best in spirit. So, belief in the messenger and the messengers and commitment to follow them because that's what belief in them means when we say وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ and I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah it means I've committed myself to following his way that's a commitment it's not just a statement of a fact it's a statement of commitment so that commitment should engender in us a commitment to follow the commandments of Allah in all of their forms. The third principle or moral characteristic is that of gratitude. About which we spoke when we talked about the books. Because as we said then, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in each and every individual a consciousness of good and evil. He did not put us in this world without that consciousness. He didn't put us in this world evil, but He put us in this world good. But good with a consciousness of both good and evil. And technically speaking, that should be sufficient to guide us. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His mercy and in His grace gave us books of revelations and messengers to show us how to apply them. So this is from Him. Not that we deserve it, that, not that it was necessary to give it to us, but it was from His grace. And this is very important for us to grasp because oftentimes uh, Christians, for example, will say, Muslims don't believe in the grace. They believe in the law. That there's no grace in Islam. No room for grace. But their idea of grace is that God just picks you out of everybody else and gives you guidance. And He picks another one and gives him guidance. And others He doesn't give guidance. For no logical reason he likes the way your beard grows. He likes your mustache, so he gives you guidance. He likes your color, so he gives you guidance. 
No. We believe Allah is most wise and He's most just. He gives guidance to those who seek it, who strive, who have a good heart, who are striving in one way or another. Maybe externally the actions may appear to be bad, but inside themselves they have a desire for good. And it is the environment which points them in an evil direction. So Allah may pull that individual out of it and guide him or her. And His grace is manifest in that fundamentally, as the Prophet ﷺ said, no one would enter paradise simply because of his or her deeds. And when the Prophet ﷺ was asked, even you, O Messenger of Allah, even you won't enter paradise without, simply by your deeds, the good deeds that we've seen you do, your life is a life of good, he said, even if it were not for Allah's grace surrounding me, even I would not enter paradise. And that is the clear evidence of the grace of Allah. But His grace comes in a logical, wise, meaningful way. In that, as He said, <clears throat> for every good deed we do, we get ten times the reward. So, in al-hasanat yudhibna sayyat, so righteous deeds can erase evil deeds. One righteous deed is worth ten times its value, whereas each evil deed is only kept at one. And this is the way that Allah's grace erases sin. And ten is just the beginning number, it increases as Allah's wills depending on the deed that we do. So in this way, the grace of Allah is there. And His sending books and messengers, this is from His grace. Not that we deserved it, but because of His infinite mercy and beneficence, He has granted it to us. And Prophet Muhammad wasallam, in his life, demonstrated for us a recognition of gratitude. We find him consistently calling people to be grateful. Saying, for example, Man lam yashkurin nas, lam yashkurillah. Whoever does not thank people, doesn't, don't thank Allah. Even though ultimately everything is coming from Allah, we're still commanded to thank people. And when he was up at night praying till his ankles were swelling and his wife asked him, O oh, Messenger of Allah, hasn't Allah forgiven your sins, the previous and the sins to come? And he answered, shouldn't I be a thankful slave of Allah? So gratitude is an essential component of the believer. So the personality trait that we're speaking about, about in the end here, last personality trait, is that of being a grateful individual who can recognize goodness in his life and in the lives around him. Who is able to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and thank him for whatever we have. And don't feel cheated. Don't feel that Things have come to us which we don't deserve. When we face difficulties, we are able to be patient because we are grateful. If we are not grateful, then it's not possible to be patient. And if we are not patient, it is not possible to be grateful. The two are inseparable. So we ask Allah's blessings, peace and blessings on Prophet Muhammad wasallam, as the guide who showed us these uh, characteristics, these moral principles that should be in our lives. And we ask Allah to keep us conscious of the way, the straight path, Surat al-Mustaqeem, which He has given us. We ask Allah to seek knowledge to understand that path and to apply it in our lives. We ask Allah to remove from us all of the obstacles 
from obedience to his commands. We ask Allah to make us grateful servants of his. We ask Allah to be patient with the trials that we face in this life. We ask Allah to keep us on the straight path in faith and that the last breath of, that we make in this life be one based on our faith. We die believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Aqimus Salah.